Do you feel shy and uncomfortable when you're doing street photography? If yes, then this video might be for you. Street photography is a lot of things. Is it comfortable? Isn't one of them? At least not in the beginning. From taking a camera and going out to photograph people comfortably, there is a long road of inconvenience, stress and inner fighting. Many people starting out never leave this space of fear and insecurity and they end up leaving street photography instead. If you are here watching this video, you are either in the beginning of your street photography career or you are someone that has persevered long enough but still you are not feeling comfortable doing street photography. For me, street photography has been my medicine against anxiety even in the hardest times of my life. So I want to help you feel comfortable doing the craft and experience the same feelings I am experiencing when I'm out in the streets photographing people and beautiful scenes. I have thought a lot about what makes us feel uncomfortable when we are out in the streets and I have reached one conclusion which I believe it is very similar for most of us. It is fear. It is the fear of having to interact with someone and this interaction may or may not lead to confrontation. It is very similar to asking someone out on a date. Before you do that, you're starting thinking, what if they say no? Or what if they get frustrated and they never talk to us again? Well, out in the streets, it's not so much the fear of losing a friendship as much as it is to lose your part in the anonymity offered by the uniformity of the masses. As with your efforts to establish any relationship, photographing strangers on the streets requires one and only skill. And this is communication. And communication starts with your own body language. If you are feeling afraid and conserved, people will usually feel threatened by you as people's feelings towards you are a reflection of your feelings towards them. So you should be feeling or at least showing that you are comfortable and relaxed. I know it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen over time. Communication extends to actually talking to them. This is something I'm not so good at, but I'm working on it as much as I can. You see, I believe that a photo of someone that you know even for just a little bit is a more meaningful photo. Of course, communication becomes vital when the person you are photographing out in the streets becomes displeased with the fact that you are photographing them. In this case, you have one and only solution. You need to sit down with them and have a discussion in a relaxed and rational fashion. Take a few minutes to talk to them about what you're doing, show them your Instagram, show them your website, and even better, if you have one, give them a professional card. I'm actually in the process right now to make one for myself. You never know, you might end up making a client from someone that you irritated briefly out on the streets. What would really help in this situation is to have a specific purpose. Back in the day I used to go around different cities and photograph just what I found beautiful. I still do that from time to time, however now I am focusing on my specific projects. If you have a goal for your photography and if you have a body of work to follow it, then it is easier to explain what you are doing to someone who is trying to confront you. And this might actually make them willing to help you in being part to what you're creating. Always have an answer ready because this shows that you are someone who is serious about your work and not just a random person who is taking a photo on the streets. In my experience, most people are willing to help and they are friendly once you explain exactly what you're doing. If someone doesn't like it, it's fine. And if they are polite and if you are polite, then it's fine. You can just agree that you do not agree and then you can move on. Now, in the very rare occasion that someone becomes aggressive, then there is only one solution. Just walk away. There is absolutely no way that you can reason with a person like that. And it has happened to me before once, and this is exactly what I did. Also, a form of communication is the like button, uh, because it communicates to me that you like this video, so I make more like this. And at the same time, it communicates to the algorithm that this video is a good one, so it can push it into bigger 
Audiences. Of course, communication is one thing. Even if you are conserved and you are not sure about communicating, there are other practical ways that can set the groundwork for you to become more confident and more relaxed out in the streets. A good behavior to have if you are enjoying this video is to hit the subscribe button down below with the bell if you haven't done already. Although it sounds counterintuitive, I'm starting my photo walks with having my camera in the bag. I realized early on that if you are suffering from some sort of social anxiety, walking around with a massive camera on your hands can only make things worse. So I will just walk around and observe, really look at what is going on. I'm calling this phase the charging up phase because I'm charging up my creativity banks. Once I have seen a lot of scenes and a lot of photos that I would desire to capture, then taking out my camera and starting shooting becomes much more natural. A charge up desire is powerful enough to help you overcome any fear. And I often find myself starting photographing in busier areas because in such places it is harder to stand out by using a camera. Also, it is very hard for someone to associate you with taking a photo of them if there are dozens of people around. However, this is a bit tricky, it raises a problem and the problem is that because the scene is so busy, it is hard to find and isolate subjects and certain scenes and get a clean composition in the end. So what, am I, what I am doing in this case is using a longer focal length like an 85mm lens or a 50mm lens on a cropped sensor and a shallow depth of field that helps me to isolate subject and get those cleaner compositions. In any case, speed is key. If you take too much time trying to frame a composition, then you are more likely to draw attention. If you take a snap in two seconds and then move on quickly, then the chances of you actually getting noticed are very, very small. Surprisingly, the exact opposite can work too. Find a nice scene, a nice spot that can work on its own and wait until someone passes through your frame. Start shooting before they enter the frame and keep shooting after they have left. This way, everyone will think that you are just photographing this nice scene in front of you and not them. In these cases, I prefer photographing with wider lenses like a 50mm or a 35mm lens so I can include more in my frame and have more room to play around. Putting your eye in the viewfinder can also be a problem as people have associated this movement with someone who is preparing to take a photo. So use the back screen of your camera instead or take a hip shot, which is exactly that. Take a photo from the hip. This way, you are not going to raise any concerns and people will probably not realize that you are actually taking a photo. And these are some of the practical things you can do to avoid confrontation on the streets. However, the type of images you make can also do exactly that. You don't need to take portraits, street portraits, that reveals people's characteristics if you don't want to. I know that many people feel the peer pressure from the gatekeepers to go straight up to people's faces and take those shots, but to be honest with you, I don't find this appealing at all. You can take perfectly good photos by keeping your subjects anonymous. You can photograph them from the back or you can keep them tiny in your frame. This is actually great advice from a compositional point of view to give a sense of scale to your images, especially when you're contradicting a huge building with a tiny human. Let me bring as an example this photo I took in London with a tiny biker contrasting the huge size of both the building behind of him, but also the huge window reflections on the street. But don't take my word for it, some of the greatest of the past, like Fred Herzog and Ernst Haas, have done this in big cities and in small neighborhoods, like this Fred Herzog black and white shots taken in Chinatown, Naimo, in 1958. Additionally, you can keep your subjects anonymous by creating silhouettes, by exposing for the highlights in a very bright scene while your subject is still on the shadows. When uh, we have a silhouette in our frame, we make the photo more 
mysterious and at the same time more relatable because I can relate better to a shadow, to a silhouette than a person that I don't feel similar to. And don't get me started with this if you open any of the books of some of the legends of street photography including Saul Leiter, Ernst Haas, Fred Herzog and of course Alex Webb, you will notice that photos that reveal people's faces are way fewer than those who utilize shadows to hide people's characteristics. And I want to stay a bit in Alex Webb's work as he manages to successfully hide people's faces in shadows but also maintain a vibrant narrative in almost every single one of his photos. We will have a deeper analysis on his work in a later video, so subscribe to the channel if you want to see that. We've discussed this in previous videos, but you can photograph only parts of people's bodies and leave their heads hidden. This technique utilizes the curiosity gap to add a mystery and storytelling to your images. A bright example of this is Saul Leiter. He has tons of famous examples using this technique, but I want to briefly talk about a shot that is included in his new book the Unseen so lighter. Specifically, I'm talking about the photo that appears in page 85. In this one, Sol has hidden the heads of not one but three people in one photo, hidden neither behind the tent on the left or the metallic pole on the right. And look how much interest this gives to the photo. And I couldn't ignore a style of street photography that I'm actually doing a lot recently. Empty spaces and empty streets are also parts of the street, so they are also parts of street photography. So photograph those empty places, photograph those items on the streets, photograph those buildings, those darker alleys, those, those darker scenes, because they usually hold more stories than a busy place does. Use colors, use shapes, use features of the streets to grab the attention of the viewer and make them ask, what is going on here? Now more than ever we need to remember what silence and stillness looks like. A brilliant book I strongly recommend that is a great example of this type of photography is Todd Heido's Intimate Distance, in which you will find moments of silence taken mostly in empty places in the absence of people. So if this sounds interesting to you, take the inspiration and use these empty places and empty spaces as your canvas to create art. There are so many things out there to photograph and there are so many different ways to photograph them. Doing something just for the sake of doing it or because someone else thinks you should do it, it can only damage your creativity. Go out there, observe and create whatever art your heart and mind desires. Then and only then you will truly unlock the secrets of street photography. Now, if you're feeling a little blocked and uh, you need some inspiration on what to shoot when it feels like there is nothing around to photograph, then click and watch this video next. That was all for today, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, I will see you on the streets. Bye-bye.